So um, tonight um, I am a speaker. And so I am going to share my screen. Wait a minute. I hope I'm going to share my screen. Share my screen. Whoops, and I'm starting at the end here. Okay, and I am going to put this down. Okay, so here we are. Um, so we're going to talk about warblers tonight. And first I need to say that I am not an expert in warblers. So why am I doing this talk? Well, um, a couple of reasons. One, I couldn't find anyone couldn't find anyone else to do the talk in May. I asked three people. They all either put me off or declined. So after asking three people, I just thought, never mind, I'll do it. And the other reason is that I have been going through my, my photos on the computer and realized I have lots of photos of warblers. And so why not do some research and put together a talk? So that's why we're doing it. Um, I need to say this is not an academic talk as last month's talk about uh, flycatchers was, uh, but I have done a lot of preparation, a lot of research and preparation, and I've learned lots. And my goal is that each of you will go away with at least one fact about warblers that you didn't know before you came to this talk. Okay, so I'll be interested to see if, in fact, you did. So we're going to, um, wait a second here. I seem to have something on my screen. Okay. Uh, I don't need this. Oh, I guess I can't get rid of that on my screen. I hope it's not blocking your screen. Um, the, the, the family we're talking about is Perulidae, or I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but it's wood warblers. Wood warblers are found only in the Americas. There are warblers, birds called warblers in other parts of the world, but they are not wood warblers. They are a different species. So we're talking tonight about wood warblers. There are about 110 species in the Americas, 56 of them in North America. The tropical warblers, some of them stay in the tropics and don't come north. So the tropical warblers, um, the sexes tend to be similar. They look alike and it's hard to tell the difference. The ones that migrate, the ones that we see, um, the males are usually more brightly patterned. Not always, but usually they are. The diet of all warblers is primarily insects, but um, you'll see that some in the winter do um, feed on nectar and um, other berries and that kind of thing. A group of warblers, is called a bouquet, a confusion, a fall, or a wrench. I like a bouquet. Confusion certainly would fit in the fall. Um, well, these two, I'm not too keen on those names. Some interesting facts, just to start off. The, the warbler with the smallest breeding range is a curtains, and it is actually in only in Michigan and a very small area of Michigan. I'm not going to talk about them because chances are we're not going to see them. Um, Blue-winged and golden-winged warblers regularly hybridize where their ranges overlap. I'm also not going to talk about them because their range is really central, north central U.S., maybe going into um, uh, south central uh, Ontario like Point Pelee. Um, I saw a blue-winged warbler in Point Pelee briefly, just a little flip. Um, so I'm not going to talk about them because really we don't see them very much. Just a second, I lost my button. Um, they do hybridize and where their range, where their ranges overlap. And the, interestingly, because we have a lot of hybrids in, not warblers, but other hybrids in um, Alberta. But interestingly, with these two, the hybrids are actually named. So they're Brewsters or Lawrences. Um, they're not, like you wouldn't find that in eBird if you're putting them in, but they have been given names. Um, and then the other interesting fact that I didn't know about warblers is that they will give injury feigning display to draw you away from their nests. I've never seen one do that that I've been aware of, 
but um, I certainly will start watching out for that this year. In migration, as we know, um, before migrating south, the, um, they lose their wing flight feathers, their tails and contour feathers of their body, um, pre-basic molt, this is called, and this is why we get the birds in the fall or in the late summer, before they go south, they grow in these new feathers and they um, tend to, the males tend to look more like the females or the young. So we call them confusing uh, fall warblers because they don't, they lose all their, their bright colors that they have in the spring. And then of course in the spring, they molt again and they get back all those lovely colors. And that's what we see at this time of year as they're coming back. So let's move into the actual birds. Oh no, first of all, this, um, I was thinking about how we identify warblers and um, someone gave me this tip, actually it was Janet Gill gave me this tip last year um, that look at the beaks. And sometimes when we're looking at uh, birds that are way high up in a tree and they're all kind of the same color and you're thinking, oh, is that a warbler, is that a vireo, what is that? If we look at the beaks, you can see there's a difference between a warbler and a vireo. And if my mouse works, you can see this is a red-eyed vireo and he has that curved down beak. This is a Tennessee warbler with a straight beak. Warbler's beaks are not all the same, but they are all pointed. They're not, they don't have that curve down. And this is a Philadelphia uh, vireo with the same curved down beak. So all the vireos have that sort of thicker beak that goes down at the end. It's a really quick way to know if you've got a, you know, if you're seeing these three birds at the top of the tree, it's sometimes hard to figure out which is which, but quick way to know if it's a vireo or a warbler. Warblers also have thinner legs and are a little bit more active than vireos, generally speaking, but, you know, nothing is um, 100%. So let's get into the actual warblers. Water thrush is um, the first one. Water, we sometimes think, may not think that a water thrush is a warbler, but it, it is in fact in that um, family of warblers. Um, they range all across Canada. Um, uh, they, um, there are two types of warblers. In the north, we get the um, northern water thrush. So this is the one that you're gonna see in Canada. So. Um, these pictures were taken, I think this was taken at uh, Waterton, and I think this was taken in Quebec. And um, the Louisiana water thrush is what you'd see if you went down to Texas or somewhere like that. You can also see the Louisiana water thrush at Point Pelee. I'm not sure how you tell the difference between them. To me, they look exactly the same, although these pictures look like they're a little bit more yellow. Um, but actually, in the field, they pretty well look very, very similar. They're found in dark wooded swamps, around bogs. They tend to walk on um, logs and things that are sticking out into the water and their tail bobs along as they walk. They're eating, um, as you would expect, insects and molls, mollusks. The male tends to sing throughout the breeding season, not just when he's trying to get a mate, but he sings throughout. And this is my observation only, um, when he sings, every time I've seen one singing, they have been sitting in close to the trunk of the tree. A lot of birds, when they sing, they go and sit way up on top of the tree or out on a branch where they're vi really visible. In my experience, a water thrush seems to sit in by the trunk. I don't know if that's a general um, observation that other people have had or not, but that's just my observation. Uh, the, there are very few warblers that are only in the West. Um, warblers tend to be an Eastern, Eastern, they um, are more in the East than in the West, but this one, the Townsend's warbler, is a West Coast warbler, and he, but he does come over into um, Alberta just barely into Alberta, just on this side of the Rockies. Um, these pictures I discovered are all females because males have a black throat, okay? 
So you can see none of these birds have black throats. So these are females. These were taken in Kananaskis. Um, they, they tend to forage high in the higher parts of the trees. They, the males come up early and establish their territories in May, but they don't, the eggs aren't laid until late June. Um, they frequently, in, on the West Coast, hybridize with hermit warbler, which I'm not going to talk about because we don't get that here. Um, hermit warbler in Washington and Oregon. What this is, I don't know if somebody can explain this to me, but what I read was that hybrids in Oregon sing like a hermit. Those in Washington sing like a Townsend. Now, how the bird knows which state it's in, I'm not sure, but um, that was in one of the research, <laughs> in one of the uh, references that I um, read. Uh, okay, so the next one that is a Western, uh, Western warbler is a Megillivrays, Megillivrays. This is a warbler that I have not seen. So these are um, not my photos. This is, uh, Shirley took this photo down in um, Waterton, I believe, uh, a female Megillivrays. And Stephen Boucher took this one, I'm not sure where, somewhere in Alberta. Uh, a male, male um, McGillivray's. They look like morning warblers. I don't really know that much about them. I've never seen one. I don't even know where to go in Alberta to see one, but maybe somebody can put that in the uh, chat box, where to go to see one. Wilson's warblers, well, we all know Wilson's warblers because they're pretty common. I mean, they, their range is right across Canada. They go as far north as Alaska. They're more common in the West than they are in the East. The males have this lovely black cap that just, they're a stunning yellow bird with this black cap. The females may have a trace of a cap. This picture was taken in Texas and it's either a young bird or a female, uh, I'm not sure. Um, these two are males. Um, and the thing about, um, the Wilsons is that the Western birds are a brighter yellow than the Eastern birds. Now, this, is, this one was taken here in Calgary. This one was in Quebec. Um, I'm not really sure that there's a difference in the yellow of their, their breast here. I don't really see that, but um, that's what they say that uh, the Western ones have a much more yellow uh, breast than the Eastern ones. Um, I've started putting in the tails here from here on um, because oftentimes when we're looking way up into a tree and you're seeing little bits of the bird as they flick between the leaves, sometimes you get a bit of wing, a bit of a head, a bit of a tail. And sometimes you can just see the under, under tail that, um, but you can often identify the bird just by the under feathers. So you can see here the, the tail is dark gray and the yellow goes, the um, undertail feathers go right down and it's all yellow. Okay, so we'll, we'll see the comparisons here as we move along. These birds are often victim to um, cowbirds. So they are often parasitized by the cowbirds. Another very common warbler that I'm sure everybody's seen around Calgary is a yellow warbler. Yellow warblers are all over, all over North America, top to bottom, they're, they're here. They're usually near, near a stream or a pond um, or some sort of water. You see them along the Bow River. Um, they eat ca caterpillars that damage shrubs. So they're a really good warbler to have because they're cleaning up our shrubs. They do tend to molt very early, so it's, they will often leave at the end of July into early August. So they come, they have their brood, they feed their kids, and then they molt while they're still um, feeding those fledglings, and then they leave. So it's be unusual to see one later in the season. They are host to cowbirds frequently. I mean, you know, when we talk about cowbirds, everybody says, oh, the yellow warbler. The yellow warbler is only one of the birds that a cowbird will parasitize, but they certainly do um, 
have to feed cowbirds. And this picture down here in the corner, this was in Lafarge Meadows, and you see this little male uh, yellow warbler is feeding this cowbird that looks big enough to go and find his own food, but is still um, demand demanding food. This poor little thing was going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, uh, feeding that cowbird. Males have stripes, reddish, whoops. Uh, males have reddish stripes on their, their fronts, whereas females are, uh, don't have the yellow stripes, okay? So females don't have stripes. And the tails, yellow all the way down. The body and the tail feathers right down. And you can see it just barely here. If I'd known I was gonna do the talk, I would have taken pictures of more tails. Uh, but um, you can see it's yellow all the way down. So that's kind of an easy one to remember. Yellow rumped warbler. These guys are back in Calgary now. We've already seen them. Um, there are, there used to be two, two species, Myrtle and Audubon, but they've now been joined together. They may split eventually again, who knows, but um, for the time being, they are one. And uh, the myrtle has the white throat. Where's my mask? Why isn't my mask working? There it is. Okay, so um, the myrtle has the white throat. The Audubon has a yellow throat. The myrtle is, only, is the only one you see in the east. You, you never see Audubons in the east. Uh, Audubons start in about Alberta and go west from here. They do hybridize in uh, where their ranges overlap in sort of northwestern Alberta. And in fact, the one I saw at Carburn this week, the, it was a hybrid because it had some yellow in the, uh, on the chin feathers. So uh, when you're looking at them, look to see, is it a pure yellow or is it a pure white? Or is there a little bit of uh, yellow uh, mixed in there. The uh, one thing interesting I read is that the myrtle has wing bars, two wing bars. The Audubon breeding male has a wing patch, not wing bars. Um, now, of course, I didn't have a picture of that because I didn't know that, didn't know to look for it. Uh, but uh, the breeding male Instead of wing bars, he has a white wing patch, quite a, quite a uh, predominant patch on his wings. They are usually the first birds up in the, um, that come north in the spring, and they may be the last to leave. They're, it's a very hardy little warbler. They'll eat anything. Um, this one is on a suet. This is my suet post in Quebec. And he had just arrived in early May and he was eating the suet. In fact, there were several of them fighting on the suet uh, because they were really hungry and that's what was there and they were eating it. The other thing interesting about them is they're called facultative migrators, meaning that they only go as far south as they have to. So this article I read was said this guy was around the Chesapeake Bay area, I think, said that um, some years when there's a lot of food in that area through the fall winter, the, um, they'll have a lot of yellow rumped warblers because they'll come down that far and say, oh good, there's a lot of food here. We don't need to go any further. And they'll stay for the winter. If there isn't food, they keep going south until they find food. So it, it's, um, they adapt to where, they're, where they can find the food. Um, the, 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 these warblers also may have a second brood. Not many, not many of the warblers will actually do a second brood, but the uh, yellow rumped warblers will. The tails are uh, white underneath to, and white patches. Slight difference between Audubon and Myrtle, but I'd be hard pressed to see that in the field for sure. The black pole warbler. Black pole is an interesting warbler because we see them here in the spring. Um, they come up from uh, wherever they've been in the south and they're heading towards Alaska, northern Ontario. They um, are really, they breed in the north.
north part of Canada all the way through to um, Alaska. They're a very abundant warbler, but we don't see them very much because they come, they migrate through Calgary. Now, if you think on the map here, Calgary is probably around here. So they breed further north than here. So we only see them flying north. What's interesting about these guys is that when they go south, they fly east across the country and then they go south. And they, so they fly east all the way over to here. They stop somewhere in here for two weeks or so and they feed up and they um, gain weight and they increase their body mass. And then they take off and they fly over the ocean. They may fly 88 hours nonstop across the ocean down to um, the north part of South America. They are, uh, I think, the only my, uh, warbler that migrates across the ocean here. Most of them come down and they hit land and hit land and, um, you know, have stopovers. But these ones go across Canada and then down. So we don't see them in the fall when they're migrating. I mean, they because they're not coming here. They're going across and down. Um, but the time to see them is the second to last week and the last weekend in May in that area. Last year, uh, I did I I um, made a mistake and did the May count the weekend before I was supposed to do the May count, uh, but I was at the Farge Meadows and I saw black pole warblers um, and saw several of them and then I did the count again on the next weekend when I was supposed to and I didn't see any black pole warblers because they had already moved on. So um, that's an interesting bird, but you got to be sharp to catch it when it goes through. Um, they uh, have a white, white um, undertail feathers coming down and just white uh, down here. When you first see this bird, you know, your first glance, you might say, oh, it's a chickadee because it has a black cap. And then you look again, you say, oh, no, it's a black and white bird. Well, no, it's not a black and white warbler because it has a complete black cap. So remember what this looks like. And then when we get to the black and white warbler, you'll see there's a, an obvious difference and uh, easy way to tell them apart. I mean, they are easy to tell apart when you really look at them. But if you're only seeing the black, the bottom or the undertail um, feathers and you're getting a quick glance, it's a good way to tell. Magnolia warbler. My notes just say such a pretty warbler. I love this little guy. He's so cute. Um, this is a male, obviously in May. This is a, a either a young or a female. It was taken in September. Um, and this, I think this is probably too young. They were fighting over this moth. It wasn't an adult feeding a young because the moth went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between them and they eventually ripped it apart and um, one of them ate it. But uh, they, that was taken in August. So you can see how the color is more like a, a disease or young warblers is more like this female. Uh, a group is called a corsage, which is very fitting because it's such a gorgeous little bird. Um, it often spreads its tail when it's uh, when I'm, you know hopping around, the tail has these square marks on it, which is distinctive. The, it's the only one that has square white markings on it. And you can almost see, like on, this is on the top of the tail, of course, but you can almost see a bit of a shadow of that um, square mark. Um, I did see one uh, website that was talking about the effect climate change, the warming of the climate change is going to have on uh, the breeding ranges of the warblers. And it had it for every warbler. And as you would expect, breeding ranges are going to move north as the climate um, warms. And, it's, and this, this thing showed maps of what will happen if uh, the temperatures go up one degree or two degrees or three degrees. And of course, the range goes further north for breeding um, and further into the Rockies. So they'll be breeding higher and higher uh, to get to the cooler weather. <clears throat> but it also makes you wonder, does that mean that if they're going to go breeding, if they're going to be breeding further north, 
will I also be wintering further, slightly further north uh, where it might not be as hot? Just a, a question. I don't know the answer to that. And it wasn't, that wasn't discussed on the website that I was on there. Um, so that's a really cute little warbler. And uh, really, in, we see this warbler in, um, in Quebec in the spring, and they're just, they're everywhere and they're not afraid. And they just stand there and look at you and practically land on you. So then we come to the Tennessee warbler. Tennessee's I always think of as being that pale gray, boring bird that just doesn't have much color. And this one here, you can see is pale gray and white and he has a bit of olive on his back, but he's, you know, there's not much distinctive about him. But what's interesting is that the females have a lot more yellow and the young are completely yellow. And, um, the like first year young, he's yellow throughout. So this I'm guessing is a first year young. Um, they have a surprisingly loud song for a warbler and they will sing repetitively, sitting up on top of a tree, just sing, 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 over and over and over again, um, and very loud. A lot of these warblers are nesting on the ground, which is surprising because we see them high up in trees um, we see them flitting around in the leaves and you're, you know, you get warbler neck trying to find them up in the trees, but a lot of them are nesting on the ground or in the, um, right against the trunks of trees. Um, so it, that's quite, to me, that was new information. I didn't realize that's where a lot of these birds are. normally I'm looking way up to see are down on the ground. Um, this one does go through population cycles because its favorite food is spruce bud worms. As a lot of them are, spruce bud worms seems to be a very popular food with borders. And so as the, the bud worms cycle, so too do the birds. This is a bird I get confused with an orange crowned warbler all the time. Um, however, orange crowned warblers are not in the east. And so, um, or are very rarely in the East. So I don't even need to think about them when I'm in the East. Um, they are, um, they differ slightly. There are four populations of them and they differ slightly in plumage and song. The Pacific population of orange crowned warblers is much more yellow, is brighter yellow. And um, these were taken here in Calgary, so I can't show you a difference in um, these warblers because these are all the same and taken here. Sexes are similar. You can't tell the difference between a male and a female. They have very pale streaking on their breast, which um, is distinctive um, and is a good way to tell them apart from other warblers. Um, Again, they nest on the ground, they like shrubby areas, they have a broken eye ring, um, and the male may have an orange crown, which is not really hard to see. Not, you can see a bit of it here, you can see a little bit of it here, um, but it's not, generally speaking, you don't see that orange crown. Okay, common yellow throat. This is a really another little pretty little guy. <clears throat> there are four varieties of yellow throats, and the difference is in the mass and the, the amount of white on the mass. So this picture was taken in Cold Lake. So look at how much white is here. This one was taken in Quebec, and you can see there's less white. This one was taken at Lafarge Meadows lots of white, okay? So different um, varieties of, of uh, yellow throats and it's, it's um, across the country is different. Um, the other thing is that the amount of yellow on the belly, which you can't really see on any of these males is different. Um, the extent to which they, the yellow goes down um, on their belly. They are one of the most abundant warblers. You see them 
marshes, wet areas. They're often in the uh, bulrushes or the cattails. They often sit right up on top of those and sing, sing, sing. They act like wrens sneaking in and out and on top of a ring and up a uh, uh, reed and up and down. They are commonly victimized by cowbirds. This is the female, I think the female, this is one of the more gorgeous females of the warblers. This yellow is just a pure lemon yellow. It's just beautiful. Um, yeah, so that's the, and they have two broods a year, which uh, as I said before, there's not that many warblers that will actually breed twice during the year, but these guys do. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, the oven bird. The oven bird's kind of hard to see sometimes because he's creeping along on the ground and going under the leaves and in into the thick scrubs. And he just, um, he acts like a thrush. He's just going along, tipping over all the leaves and um, eating whatever he can find. He also nests on the ground, which is what you would expect. His nest is, he's called an oven bird because his nest is like a dome with a side entrance to it. So it's like an oven, hence oven bird, very cool. Um, bobs his tail, his head when he's walking and flicks, tail flicks slowly when he's sitting still. So, you know, when he sees you, he tends to freeze and then the tail's just very slowly going up and down, up and down. He's quite easily, if you don't see the whole bird, it's quite easy to confuse him with a thrush because of the heavy spotting on the front and the eye ring and the same sort of color on the back. But if you can see the top of his head, it's clearly uh, not a thrush and clearly uh, those black stripes with the orange in the middle uh, clearly makes him an oven bird. So he's very cool. Oh, I should have said at the beginning, I have not put songs in because of two reasons. One, I didn't know how to do it. And two, I can't hear them anyway. So I have to identify uh, warblers by sight and by all these other things. I can't identify them by the songs because I can't hear them. So that's why we're not hearing songs tonight. Uh, okay, Red Start, American Red Start. This is such a pretty guy. He's all, right, all across Canada. Um, winters as far south as Brazil. What's interesting, uh, the new fact for me about this was the male red start does not get his purple, his purple, his orange um, coloring, his, his striking coloring. He, that does not happen until the second year. So the first year male looks like a female. I don't know if it's a male or female, but the first year male looks like a female. He may try to breed, but he probably isn't going to be that successful in attracting a female because he doesn't look like a male. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, I think that's the only warbler that has that delay in getting into his bright colors. Um, he also deciduous woodland with scrubby undergrowth. They do nest up 15 feet up, and they are parasitized by cowbirds. Um, one description of them was a mad series of darts and dives and whirls of onward rushes and as sudden stops. This is a constantly moving little bird, but striking, striking in color. They fan their tails and show off this, these windows, they call them the windows of color in their uh, tails. They show them off because they're so pretty. Uh, okay, so Nashville, Nashville's not all that um, striking a bird. It's kind of uh, not as striking as uh, some of the others. Has a nice yellow breast and a gray head with a big white eye ring. Um, they do have this color, rusty color in the top of their head, which you can't always see, but this guy just bent over for me and showed it to me. Um, but these two, of course, you can't see. This is a female little... Sexes are similar, but um, not, this has a definite gray head um, differentiating from the yellow breast. This one's kind of more modeled. So this is probably a female, but it, or it could be a young. It was taken in August. Um, this is a male in May breeding 
breeding colors, nests on the ground again or under shrubs. And hey, interesting news is porcupine quills is nest material. Um, that's interesting. I can't quite picture that, but um, that's what it says. Um, tail yellow and uh, feathers, tail feathers, uh, I can't really see it there. Uh, no white on the, on the tail feathers, just the yellow body coming down. Palm warbler. Um, okay, so the palm warbler is across Canada, all the way across, the, um, but a lot of the birds that um, come across Canada, the range, their breeding range, goes across Canada, and then as it gets through Saskatchewan and hits Alberta, it sort of tends to go north. So this one in um, as one, the range, the breeding range is north of Calgary, it would be up, this, this picture was taken in Cold Lake. Um, so they, a lot of them, they breed across Eastern Canada, and then the range tends to you can't see my hands, but I'm <laughs> I'm showing you with my hands, but you can't see that. Um, so it goes up through northern uh, Alberta. The western, um, the western one, which breeds from H Hudson Bay West, has a white belly. The eastern one, which is more Atlantic Canada, New England, they say the underside is entirely yellow. Now this one was taken in Quebec. This one was taken in Cold Lake. Can't really see the bellies, okay? But one would expect that this is a white belly under here, and maybe this is a yellow belly, but that's kind of hard to see. So I'm not sure. This was taken here in Calgary in August, so this was a migrating bird going south. Um, females tend to look like the males in breeding season, but um, this is one who's already started to uh, loses colors, molting for the flight size. They wag their tails vigorously. Um, they have, they both of them have a bright undertail, bright yellow, and then these white spots at the ends of their tail. Okay, remember some of the others had white up here. These ones have these white patches at the end of the tail, as you can sort of see here. Um, a group of them is called a reading. Interesting. They, they didn't have word names for all the groups, but a group of palm warblers is called a reading. Interesting. Chestnut sided warbler. Some people think this is a beautiful bird. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Just that bird, I don't know, it doesn't appeal to me. Um, but it is, um, it prefers second growth woodlands. So this bird is doing very well because, of course, there's a lot of second growth forest around. And so it is uh, a very common bird and, and increasing in numbers. It nests a few feet above the ground again, eats insects and some fruit. Um, the female lacks, these are all males, the females lacks this black around the face, okay? And it's uh, one of the most abundant breeders in deciduous forests. They said it's the only warbler that is white, pure white, from the chin all the way down, okay? So it has this lovely rust bar, but other than that, it is pure white all the way down. So that's a pretty distinguishing factor. If you're catching glimpses of it between the leaves, um, if it's all white all the way down, it's going to be a chestnut-sided warbler. Um, Okay, it is frequently parasitized by uh, cowbirds, so uh, cowbirds seem to like the warblers, um, and it, uh, yeah, so it's the chestnut side of it. Cape May, Cape May warbler, one of the prettiest warblers. Um, Eastern Canada, U.S., and Northern Alberta. Um, it prefers spruce forests. It is, has been called the tiger of the north because it fearlessly attacks other birds that come near its nest. It's quite an aggressive warbler. Um, in the winter, when it's in the south, it, might fight, it may fight off the hummingbirds to get to nectar, the nectar. 
Um, the tongue in this warbler is uniquely um, adapted to collect nectar in the winter. So it has a sort of rolled tongue that it um, can act like a hummingbird and get, uh, get nectar. It's in decline because of the um, insecticides that are used to control spruce budworm, um, which is its favorite food, which as I said, the spruce budworm seems to be the favorite of a lot of these warblers. So you would expect that a lot of them, if we kill off all the spruce budworms, we're going to have a problem with the warblers. These were, uh, I can't see my, um, this picture up here. I think this was a fall warbler. These are obviously breeding males. And this is the one that was here in Calgary in January at the Flynn's house. Um, so you can see this is a, a female, doesn't have the, the bright color, um, has um, lost some of the, the colors, similar to this one, a fall bird. Uh, the tail, a little bit of yellow, but primarily white, and the white patches that go almost, almost all the way down to the bottom. A black-throated green warbler. This is an eastern bird, um, but also northern Alberta. I did see these in Cold Lake. Um, not you're probably not going to see them here unless they're migrating through. But there are lots of these in the east. Uh, they nest in conifers. They um, sing persistently in the breeding season. Um, one, one was reported 466 songs in one hour. It's amazing. This bird is very closely related to the Townsend's warbler. Remember, the Townsend's warbler was the first one I talked about, and I only had pictures of the female who didn't have the black chin. This is the male, um, uh, black throat and green. The male Townsend's would have this same black chin that this one does. Okay, this is either a young or a female taken in August, and this is this is May. So this is probably a female because um, this is a May bird. Um, yeah, and their tails white all the way down. Okay, um, it's the only eastern warbler that the cheeks are bright yellow like this. You know how bright yellow they are. <clears throat> Canada Warbler. Um, this one, I don't know why this one's kind of not seen as, I, mean, I have trouble seeing this bird too often, although last year, uh, these two pictures were taken in Cold Lake in May, um, where this bird was just sitting there singing and giving us great views of him. Such a pretty bird, yellow eye ring and a heavy necklace that he has, heavy black necklace. And then in August in Quebec, this little guy popped into my garden. And so this is either a young or a female because he doesn't have the heavy necklace. Looks similar, but doesn't have the heavy necklace. So I would say he's either a young or a female. And, um, Sorry, I'm just going one page too far. Um, so they, the young, the females and the young are similar, but have this paler necklace. So I can't really tell. Um, undergrowth of mature, uh, preferably near swamps and streams. They dart around like a flycatcher, nests on or near the ground again. Interesting. Tail is, aha, you can see tails here. Uh, great dark gray tail feathers with the white under tail feathers and then the yellow um, coming in up there. That's a pretty one. Black and white. Um, this is a very common bird in the East. Um, also here um, to some degree, um, they don't go into BC. The sexes are similar except for the cheek. So this is a male with the black cheek. This is a female without the black cheek, okay? Um, so this is a male here, he's got black cheek. They are, they used to be called black and white creepers. 
um, because that's what they do is they creep just like a creeper, except they go up and down the tree, not just up the tree like a creeper. <clears throat> they, um, feed, they feed very similar to nuthatches. They're not out on the ends of leaves picking uh, bugs off the leaves like the other warblers. They're picking the food out of the bark and off the, the um, trunks of the trees. Sorry. <laughs> They're a very aggressive warbler and they attack nuthatches and chickadees and anybody who gets in their way. Um, then they're one of the first to come back, uh, not as not probably as early as a yellow rumped, but they do are pretty pretty um, quick to come back. Usually nest on the ground again. Interesting. And here's the the tail. Remember I said with the black pole warbler, um, the this was all white. There was no black in the under um, tail feathers with the um, or underbody feathers with the. Um, Black pole warbler, the black and white has just black feathers down here and pure white undertail. Um, so that's a, a cute little warbler and one that you probably see around. Blackburnian. Blackburnian is one that um, I've even been asked about Blackburnians when I've been in other countries. Have I ever seen a Blackburnian warbler? Um, I guess. People think it's one of the prettiest warblers, which it is, although I like magnolia, but um, this is a very striking bird, um, mostly southeast, south central Canada. So you're going to, uh, you see this in the east a lot. The male has white wing patches rather than bars. The female has bars, the bars and a patch on the male. They nest high up in the tree, um, far out on limbs. Okay, so in, in different than the others, they're way up in the top. Um, the, okay, so the, obviously this is a male, this is a male, a male. This is a female, this was in the spring, it's a female. This was, uh, I think this is August. So this is a molted or a female. This is a molting one in August. Um, so you can see how they're going to start getting confusing to figure out what they are. Uh, undertail, um, pretty well white all the way down. Bay-breasted warbler. Uh, uh, BC to the maritime. So this is uh, across all the way across Canada um, in the north, sort of going across the north. Um, you can also see them along the coast in California. Spruce forests, uh, eats caterpillars and that kind of um, stuff. Their numbers also may uh, vary depending on the spruce budworm infest infestation. That's their favorite food. They move more slowly compared to the other warblers, although all warblers are pretty fast, I think, when I'm trying to get pictures of them. But um, they are apparently a little bit slower. Slower um, in the in the uh, spring, the male is very distinctive. He has this very dark and this rust up here, and, and uh, not as much rust on his side as the chestnut side of the warbler, but it's a little paler rust here. In the fall, they become more like the females. Um, this is probably a female in the spring. I think this is a young one. Um, so you can see the, the kind of the colors, they become one of these confusing. I mean, if you didn't see that, you might even think that was a orange crown, maybe. You know, it, they get they're kind of hard. However, their tails, um, they have the white patch and then it's not really yellow and it's not really white. It's kind of a beigey color um, in their underneath part. Black-throated blue is a eastern warbler, gorgeous little warbler, um, nest near the ground um, in a shrub or a young tree. Um, the female incubates, and and but they both feed the young. They um, the female is quite different than the male. This is not a very good picture of a female. 
but the distinguishing factor on a female is this white patch. See, he has it here and she has it. She actually looks very like a Tennessee warbler, not in this picture, but in real life she does, except for that patch. So um, whenever I see a, like a dull gray bird that is um, not very distinctive, look for that little patch and then it's a, it could be a female black-throated blue. Not found here, but <clears throat> in these. Interesting, 80% of the pairs stay together over years. Now that was the only documentation I found about warbler pairs staying together from one year to the next. So I have to think that that is unique to these warblers that they mate for more than just one season. Um, the male and the female under feathers are different. They are very different looking birds. So the male and the female are quite different. The male kind of has this heart shaped uh, white patches underneath his tail. Um, the female's yellow <coughs> all the way down. <coughs> okay. Northern Perula is um, another Eastern warbler. Um, a very pretty, this is one of the smallest warblers, very pretty little warbler. Um, the females are similar, but a little duller than the male. There is a tropical perula that is very similar to this, except it doesn't have this rust color that you can barely see there, but you can see it here. It doesn't have the rust across the, the chest there, um, the breast, the, but the northern perulas do have this. This is a molting one or a young one in, uh, in August, you can still see it's, it's got that um, distinctive color of a northern perula. Um, they, are, they are often fearless and you can get really close to them. There are lots of them in, in Quebec where I go and uh, it's quite a common bird to see and, and quite easy to get close to. Cute little guy. Prothonotory warbler. <clears throat> Prothonotory warbler I put in because I know a lot of you are going to set Point Pelee and um, that's where you see prothonotary warblers in Canada. Um, they, their range really is south central, southeast Ontario in that Point Pelee area, which I have a map of that coming up, um, and eastern U.S. They don't really come into Canada much at all. Um, they winter in mangrove swamps. They, in Canada, they, they actually will nest in cavities. Um, often old chickadee nests or in nest boxes, but usually over a swamp. So there, it needs to be a swamp or a bog or some sort of still um, water that has trees growing out of it or dead trees in it. Um, and that's where they'll nest. Um, and interestingly about these guys apparently is that the fledglings can swim, which I guess makes sense if you're going to nest in a cavity over water it would be a good idea if your nestlings could swim. So apparently these guys can, never know. Um, but imagine if you actually lived in southeastern Ontario down by Leamington or something and you lived with a swamp in your backyard and put up a nest box and you had a prothonotory warbler nesting in it, that would be quite something. Um, these pictures are not good, but these were taken at Point Pelee a couple of years ago. Um, and they are uh, decreasing because of loss of habitat. They are parasitized by cowbirds, which is interesting because that means the cowbird's going into the nest box, which I don't know, that strikes me as kind of interesting. I didn't know that cowbirds would do that, but uh, who knows? And they will com compete with house wrens for their boxes. Hooded warbler is not a warbler that we're going to see here, except in 2015. I put him in just because we did see one here in Calgary in 2015. It is an Eastern bird. Only the male has the hood. He's quite dramatic. Um, nests in low undergrowth, but it's not one that you're even going to see in Eastern, U in Eastern Canada. He's really uh, a Eastern U.S. 
bird, except for when he came here that one time. Um, okay, so this picture is out of a book that I was reading that um, is, it was talking about sort of levels of where the birds feed in the tree. This is not what I've talked about, but this is your black throated green, sort of at the lower levels, then the myrtle, then the Blackburnian, and a Cape May up at the top of the tree. Um, so, it, you know, often you see a mixed flock of warblers um, in the spring or when they're migrating, they're often in mixed flocks and they will be feeding at different levels in the tree. I just remembered something I forgot about the Cape May warbler. Um, remember the Cape May warbler is that really, really pretty one. He, when the, their nest, they nest high up in the tree but it's very difficult to find the nest because the bird never flies straight into the nest. He flies in at the bottom of the tree and then travels up the tree to the nest. And when he wants to leave the nest, the male or the female goes down to the bottom of the tree and then flies out from the tree. So it's very difficult to find a nest of a Cape May warbler. Just remember that. Okay, so where should we go to see warblers? Um, in locally, for some reason, Confederation Park and Mallard Point are the two places in Calgary that are kind of known for warblers. Confederation Park makes sense because there's a, that stream that runs through it and it has low scrubby bushes all along it. It has a bit few con coniferous trees and um, it's got good habitat for warblers. So, um, Confederation Park is a good place to go. Mallard Point is a good place to go. For some reason, there always seem to be warblers at the right time of year, of course, in those bushes right across from the parking lot. Um, and if you go in uh, at the right time of year, you're going to find birds sitting there waiting for the warblers. In Alberta, uh, Cold Lake, northeastern Alberta, end of May, last weekend of May, last week of May, first week of June. Um, the Cold Lake Provincial Park is um, a good place to go for warblers. This was uh, um, an article that was in the Globe and Mail in um, 2000, um, in March this year. Um, and it was an article about um, the increase of birding because of COVID and how many more people are actually birding now. Um, and this was, it was, Jody Allaire was quoted in this article. As you, some of you know, Jody Allaire, he lives in Drumheller, but he, is a director for Community Engagement for Birds Canada. And he recommended five places for migrating birds. One in BC, Frank Lake in Alberta, that's not for, mig for uh, warblers, that's for migrating, uh, conspicuous migratory birds, he said, which means the bigger guys, the, the uh, shorebirds and the um, ducks and all the rest of that. And then he says Point Pelee, um, which we're going to talk about, Long Point, Rondo, and Pelee Island on Lake Erie. Um, this is Canada's most southerly point, is Point Pelee, and a lot of you have been or are going or should go to Point Pelee. And then he mentions Tadoussac, Quebec, which is where I go, um, an incredible birding migration phenomenon, and then Gremenin in New Brunswick. So it's just interesting that five places in Canada Frank Lake is one of them, uh, Point Pelee, which we most of us have been to, or a lot of us have been to, and my place, Tabsa. So Point Pelee is a national park. This is Lake Erie here. Um, this is Pelee Island down here. Um, this is uh, Windsor's over here. Toronto's way over to the right of the screen. Point Pelee sticks way down into um, Lake Erie. So the birds fly, they're flying north, they fly across Lake Erie, and they land in Point Pelee. Uh, Point Pelee looks like this, um, paths going through tall, tall, tall trees in early May, all leafing out, um, but lots of birds and lots of people. Um, the good thing about Point Pelee and the bad thing about Point Pelee is that there are lots of people, like hundreds of birders. It's, what's good about that is that you will see every bird that's there because people will tell you where it is. So people will say, go down there 30 meters 
look to the left in the tree that's got a bend in it and there's a whatever. And so any bird that's there and a lot of birds that not more than just warblers, lots of birds, you're gonna see because you're gonna know where they are. You don't have to look that hard. Thing is when you get there, there's probably 30 people also trying to find that bird. Um, but a lot of walking at Point Pelee because you're walking up and down this point, uh, but there are other places around Point Pelee. Um, this, this waterway here is good. There's a marsh. Um, and then Long Point and those other places are Rondo and that are just down the uh, coast of, of the lake. Uh, at really there's a big campground that is, I've camped in there and good birding in there as well. Um, so that's a key place to go. If you haven't been to Point Keeley, you probably should go um, because it is a good place for uh, warblers. First and second week of May um, is the best time for Point Peely, but you need to reserve a hotel room at least a year ahead of time. Um, don't try, don't show up and expect to find a hotel or you'll be staying up in Essex or Staples or somewhere because these down here, it is solidly booked. People from all around the world, it's very interesting. And then Tadasak is the other place to go birding. Um, this was in the New York Times um, in 2018. Uh, this guy from Ian Davis from uh, eBird from Cornell went to Tadasak hoping for a 50,000 bird day. They actually saw 720 plus warblers in one day. Where is Tadasak? Tadasak is here. Uh, northeast of Quebec City, where the Saguenay River meets the St. Lawrence River, and the birds come up and they fly across the river here. And um, it's, yeah, that's where it is. This is his eBird, uh, his eBird report for that day in 2018. Um, singular, single binocular scan, hundreds or low thousands of warblers at high level. I was not there that year. I'd been there two weeks before and left. Um, so I wasn't there at the peak. We saw lots of birds two weeks before, but not this number of birds. I was there the next year at the right time. Uh, didn't see that many, but certainly saw way more than I could count. Uh, I didn't even put in a list because I had no idea how to count it. Um, but this is, that's the warblers that he saw. Uh, okay, so next slide is these are the resources I used. So I just want to say thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions and please don't forget to send me your um, ideas for next year, please. Okay, there we are back. Okay, so let me the chat box and see. Okay, well, there's Andrews. Oh, McGilvery's. We found them off Highway 68, a bit higher elevations in your campgrounds. Okay, that's good to know. Elk Water Lake for those warblers breeding there. So that must be for McGilvery's as well. West of Longview, right near the Kananaskis Parts, all kind of into the west. Okay. Good. What's the best time to visit Tadasak? Um, for warblers, it's going to be the last week of May. Um, that report that he put in was, I think, the 28th of May, uh, the 20 around that, that week, the last sort of week of May is, um, I mean, it's good all through May, but it's the last week, it seems to be the peak of when most are there. Um, the fall migration in, in Tadasak is good, but it's, it's a little trickier because the birds come through in waves. And I was there all fall last year. Um, and, you know, one week the sparrows all went through, one week the finches went through. And I mean, there were lots, like one, there was a guy counting and uh, he counted 23,000. 23, 
crossbills in one day going across the dunes. And I'm standing there beside him and he's saying, here they come and a flock goes by. And he said, that was 62. <laughs> and it was incredible, but it, the numbers are incredible of migrants, but it's just, they're not all at once. Whereas in the spring, the warblers are coming mostly the last week of May and there are lots of them. So, um, okay. Wow, there's Lori. Oh yeah, you're going to Point Pelee and Cold Lake at the end of May. Well, you're gonna be overdone with warblers. <laughs> what camera lens? Oh, I have a Lumix, Panasonic Lumix with a, uh, what is it? A one to 300 lens. It's a mirrorless camera, so it's really a 600 lens. It, it's, it's equivalent to that. Um, oh, somebody's saying she did learn something new. Good, thank you. Um, good. Family is for Imperial Yoga. Great photo. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? No? Well, if there are no more questions, then um, again, please send me ideas um, because I need ideas for the fall and for next year. And uh, it would be good. And I mean, if you want to give a talk yourself, that would be great. If you have uh, a special interest in birds, do some research and put together a talk. Um, that would be super, um, but I, I would like to get some people. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, I got to figure out how many people are here. Okay, good. Thank you. Good night. Have a happy summer, everybody. I'll see you in September.